I got my start at Filmation by auditioning for the, so, uh, the show, the original Ghostbusters. And we, all of us in town, all the voiceover people knew it was a sweet deal because Lou Scheimer had the reputation of not picking at you so you wouldn't heal. He let you have some head and gave you time to, you know, get out there and trot out your characters. And it was just a more a creative atmosphere. They didn't have guests come in in those days. And so we knew we would be up to doing three characters at least per show. So it was, uh, I was fortunate to get that. And then I became part of the repertory company at Filmation, which was a wonderful ride for about four years. Lou Scheimer had an unusual way of casting. He didn't. Here's what he'd do. He'd have you come into your office. This is after you got to know him and you got in there. He had his own little repertory company. And he'd have a cup of coffee and he'd make sure that you had a cup of coffee. And then he'd lay out the designs of all the characters. A model sheet. So you maybe have 15, 20 characters that would reoccur and it'd be on the table. You'd be with the other actors, and he'd go, okay, Pat, what, what are you going to play this year? And I'd go, well, I, I kind of, what's this one? Oh, that's, that, that's a character that's skinny. Okay. Well, I could do something like this, maybe like that, right. He goes, well, what else? Because you've got to have three or four or five. Come on. And so then I'd go, well, I, I think if this big heavy guy I could separate. Because we're thinking we've got to separate these. We're always thinking, oh, we could have dialogue with ourselves. They've got to separate. That's the term in animation for sounding different. So I'd go, well, we get a character heavier like that. Well, then maybe there'd be something nasal I could do. And, you know, so you'd, you'd just go shopping. And at that time, you know, uh, you'd get a, a, a series there, and it was about 75, 85 grand. And so here you are in this opportunity, in this wonderful man's office going, hmm, they're going to pay me $85,000 and I get to p choose my roles? Okay. <laughs> now on Ghostbusters, the original Ghostbusters, I played Jake Kong, which was the lead character, and he was a teenager. So, you know, now I can't do a teenager for the life of me. I mean, even then it was a teenager with a mortgage, right? It was a little bit, you know, uh, a little bit of a stretch. But I played Jake, and I played uh, Ghostbuster, or uh, Buggy, Ghost Buggy, and I can't remember what else I played. I played another one that came up uh, frequently. Since we played them all, we played the, uh, the extra characters, too, too, that would arrive on the scene. After the success of He-Man, when Filmation opened up the market of 65 episode buys, we would go into Filmation and record two shows a day on Tuesdays and two shows on Thursdays. And we would receive the scripts in advance, which wasn't part of our union ruling at that time. They just were smart and they wanted us prepared so we can go in there and get the work done. So many of these scripts didn't have all the details of action and so he sometimes had to guess at what was going on. Erica, our director, would go, no, no, you're not falling off a horse, you're falling off a cliff. Okay, let's do that again. Uh, but all the actors are really on their chops when they came in and we could whistle. In fact, it was like recording a radio play. Sometimes we'd have two, three-page rolls, which is really unheard of. Uh, but it was, a, it was a joy to be able to do it that way. And with a 65X and with a 65 episode buy, you could really get to know the cast well, know where they were taking you, and wonderful ensemble opportunities for that. You know, one of the fondest memories I have was when I first started working at Filmation and I sat next to Alan Oppenheimer, formidable actor, knew him from on-camera work. So he trots out a character and he starts to go, I did this and did the sound. I thought, what a weird choice is that? So I do 65 shows sitting next to him. And finally, after a few months, I get to see one of the shows after it's completed. It turned out his character had kind of an electronic Jacob's Ladder that would shoot electricity across. And I went, oh, I get it now. I thought he sort of had Tourette's. Many fond memories of working at, uh, at the various shows uh, with Filmation, but that one sticks out because I was green. I owe my career to Filmation. They took me on as a green actor, perhaps saw some potential, but I went about 300 shows with them and over 1,000 characters. And that really uh, was the uh, graduate school for a young actor to get into character voice. Something interesting about Filmation is they did not rely on vocal effects or, uh, or post-processing of the voice. For example, when I did Thunderstick in Brave Star, I played a mechanical hick and he sort of talked like this, right? So it was up to me to create that kind of mechanical sound. 
Um, I know that Alan Oppenheimer, who did a lot of huge, full-blown villains, all I did is slap reverb or echo on him. So it was up to us. Um, in the original Ghostbusters, I played a car. Now, wait a minute! <laughs> Are you gonna... And I'd go through my script and mark those places where I could, if I had an S, so I could go like a radiator, steam, uh, uh, also with uh, starting, now what are you going to do here? So I'd mark my script for those effects, and uh, it was pretty much up to us. Oh. <laughs> At Filmation, they didn't have guests. So what happened is the entire cast did every single character that was on the screen. Even Erica and Lou would come in, uh, like cobbler's elves at midnight and all of a sudden magically come up with the extra characters and so we really got a workout now when we recorded these we always did them in order we never would uh, for example if I had a scene with myself as brave star and thunderstick uh, you're gonna get it now and who's telling me what I do well I'll tell you you know we had to go back and forth with it so hey how you doing I'm doing pretty good what's he talking about well, I was talking about whether you guys got together. Well, I didn't know about that. So we had to go one after another. Now, sometimes we'd take a pause between those lines, but we never went in, as some production companies do, and do one character, and then go do the next character and the third. <laughs> At Filmation, because we did so many characters, and they would reoccur in the 65 episodes, um, it became a bit of a problem to remember a character you'd done in episode 4, and now you're at episode 36. So here's what Erica Scheimer would do. We had reference cassettes. We use cassettes then. You know what cassettes are, don't you? So she'd slap in a cassette of, uh, of something we'd done before, and we could work it up. And that was most helpful. Uh, as far as the uh, reoccurring characters we, we did uh, in every episode, not a problem. I mean, you know, they were just... Uh, uh, you just haven't contained. It's interestingly enough, you don't remember the character by the sound. It's the feel. You know, if you're doing a character like that, it's not so much me hearing it, but feeling that tension. And then when I feel it, and, and then I have my lips in a certain way to do that heck accent, that's what reminds me of it. So it's more kinetic than aural. Yeah. It's always a unique experience to see the finished animation when you've gone in and without anything except perhaps a design come up with a character voice. Sometimes you're shocked at what the character looks like and other times you're delighted. I know that as a young man, and these were my salad days, um, I watched episode after episode, and Ghostbusters was my first, going, oh, you didn't go far enough. You didn't go far enough. It takes a lot of energy and a lot of, uh, of uh, solid, strong playing to realize a character uh, in animation. And it took me about, oh, I guess up to episode 40 where I went, oh, you went a little too far there. And so uh, it, it was an interesting experience. Here's something unique about Filmation, unlike any of the other production houses in Hollywood, even in the 80s. You could go from floor to floor in the Filmation building and you could see the project you were working on in the various stages of completion. It was a phenomenal uh, opportunity. Uh, you could go up and see storyboard, you could go to the next floor, you could see them uh, actually painting cells. It was great. And so at any given time, you could really go shopping there and see where were we at? What's that gonna look like? Who's doing the layouts? Terrific. And lose the biggest guy that'll tell us that he was frugal, but he was trying to do something nobody else was doing. He was keeping all these people employed in America doing American animation. So we always worked with him. And the good news is that <clears throat> he allowed us to be more creative than most other production companies. He really gave us the, the opportunity to try out different things. I mean, the idea of doing this kind of voice for thunder stick, that came from my stepmother who had had a, a slight polio. And so when she spoke, she had to create mechanically the sound. Well, I brought that to the table, said I'll lower the voice, make hick out of it. Not very many production companies would go, yeah, go ahead, give it a shot. And so uh, it, it was a wonderfully creative uh, place to work. And not just for the, uh, the voice talent. This went all the way through all the directors, everybody. They had more room to move. Not a lot of dough, but a lot of room to move. <laughs> 
Here's my fondest memory of working with Filmation. Erica Schreimer used to have to, you know, keep us, we were, you know, it was chaos and she would contain it, although not dampen our, our spirits because that's what an uh, animation recording session is all about. Wild and woolly, ad libs, uh, uh, lines that don't fit in, retake them, but we were amused. But she would keep us contained. But then once in a while she'd have to get a little taciturn with us. So at one point, I remember one show, she said, okay, yeah, knock it off, you know, let's get back to work. And she used to have a rolling chair that she used. And so just after she announces that we have to get ready, she leans back with a little bit of pride. She was a young gal then. And she went way up in the air, over backwards. And she, ha she was such a good sport that she laid there for a while and kicked her legs up just to amuse the other children. Nice memory. I'm surprised and delighted at how many people remember my work in the 80s. <laughs> I, you know, I, I try to give them as many inter interviews as possible, email interviews, and be as responsive a, as I can. And it's always a pleasure for a performer to know that there's the, uh, an audience out there. That's why I got into it, and so it's a pleasure to hear from fans, to uh, know that I delighted them when they were sitting Indian style in front of the TV at six years old. I think uh, uh, my job goes along with, uh, you know, cereal. You know, they were eating cereal and listening and watching me. Let's go! You know, I gotta tell you, in all, uh, in 30 years of doing animation, I've never been harassed or bothered by a fan. I've had some more adamant uh, than others about getting an autograph, but hey, you know, that's great. I'm a teacher, I'm looking for motivated people. So giving out an autograph or sending one back in the mail, never a problem. I was a classically trained actor. I got a Master of Fine Arts in Professional Acting at Cornell University. Then I emigrated to Australia to start doing Shakespeare. It turned out I wasn't so good at it. But at the same time, they wanted somebody to do a voice in a commercial. I turned out really good at that. And so I'm a failed Shakespearean actor that bumped into a flourishing, wonderful 30-year career. And I suppose one of the real joys of doing character voice acting is I've been able to be babies and ducks and dogs. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll do my baby for you. I don't know if this will rustle the, uh, the microphone. Let me know if I rustle it. Is that okay? Okay. Huh? Jewish baby? Italian baby. <laughs> now, where else can you pay a mortgage? Let's go! I've done about 4,000 shows in my career, and I've got to say that it was the most pleasant time of my career working for Filmation. Lou Scheimer, Erica, the people there, the other players. It just was a golden era for a young actor, and uh, I'll always be grateful for, to the Scheimers for giving me my career. I mean, where else do they teach you to do that goofy stuff, right? You, you can't get that at U Cornell University. And uh, I was given the opportunity to learn as a young man and had faith put into me and trusts that I would deliver the goods, and I tried to, and I'll always be grateful and have a wonderful, wonderful uh, memory of that time. Let's go, 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 go. <laughs>